Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys? Okay. Yeah. Another day in the life. If you ever want to talk about serious things, I'm yours. And I'll just get started. What I mean by serious, my mother-in-law is dead thanks to COVID-19. A pupil from my class, high school class, he also died. So I have a couple of people very close to me. Uh, so I just want to say, you know, I'm affected by what's going on. And I'm always willing to talk about it because I totally trust that our president wants to do the best. Mike Schatz wants to do the best. These are very competent people. Our engineers are amazing. You know, our uh, our biology people are amazing. Uh, and we have, we are, you know, screwed. So to get your mind off that, but I'm always willing to talk about it, uh, I will now share a video. Rule is it just Here comes a very nice at any point and I'll stop it. Of what we have learned about matrices and their eigenvalues and eigenvectors. It's called normal modes. You're very familiar with it. When you hit the string and you try to get a note in on the guitar, you try to get it in a pure tone, which is a normal mode. So it's a pattern in which you have certain number of nodes or wavelengths along the string. And the dynamics is simply that nodal lines don't move, zeros don't move, and the amplitudes go up and down uh, with the frequency of the node. So that's the simplest example. A more sophisticated example, uh, which I put as a figure at the start of this video, are chladni patterns that you vibrate a plate and you put a little sand on it and the sand moves from vibrating area to nodal lines, giving you the nodal pattern. What's the big deal about all this? When you have a many body system, you have molecules, you have neural networks consisting of neurons. What the rules is not behavior of individual particle, but the collective modes. And normal modes are very early, a very clean example of it. So the idea is quite simple and easiest to explain by thinking of a spring mattress or by thinking of a bunch of molecules interacting in some way or other. And on a classical level, there's a classical Hamiltonian of n particles. So this is kinetic energy term. And some potential that describes the potential energy of locating the n particles and molecules and whatever into n different positions. These particles interacting by Van der Waals force, by electrostatic force, by whatever is correct uh, formula for your particular physical problem. Now we assume that this potential has a minimum. So it's some minimal energy configuration in which nothing moves, typically an equilibrium configuration. You can think of a bunch of particles interacting by some forces, and you found a configuration that you can draw as a bottom of some potential in many dimensions. Maybe there are three and such things. Now there's a particular choice of all of them, which we call X star, which has a property Then when I draw this potential, it's minimal at that point. 
So that's a resting point of the system. All the forces just in balance and nothing moves. Uh, we assume that P of X is smooth. If we change a little bit the X, uh, we find ourselves in a slightly different location, but not discontinuously different. So if you add a little perturbation to this, then you can think of the value at the minimum plus, and we just do multi Taylor expansion, a second derivative plus a high order term in delta x, which we will neglect to just go the first two orders. Now, if we have an equilibrium, we are at the bottom of the well, so it's flat. And the first non-vanishing term is the matrix of second derivative. So let's define this to be a matrix B i j, which is the value of the matrix evaluated at the equilibrium point. This is the curvature. And if I'm a bottom of the well, moving in any direction should increase energy, so this should have positive curvature. No matter how complicated, how rich the law of interactions of all these possible particles is, if I look to equilibrium and close to equilibrium, I always find that small deformations will be described by a symmetric matrix. But this ij it goes over the degrees of freedom. For example, here there are n particles, each one of them having three coordinates. In the leading approximations of small deformations around static system sitting at the bottom of its energy potential, we have an effective Hamiltonian which describes small deformations close to the bottom of the potential well. This is a parabolic approximation. State of the system, configuration coordinate times this transpose times this matrix. So all classical systems which abound can always describe in this way. So there's an effective spring because this now looks like a harmonic oscillator, but in many dimensions, which has some kind of symmetric tensor stuck in here. One half is just came from Taylor expansion, but basically because there are two terms here. Symmetric matrix can always be diagonalized. There is some orthogonal transformation. This is a real matrix, which I will not write out, but the result of it if I go into new coordinates, a matrix orthogonal transformation are in more generally unitary if these are complex fields. Where these factors are obtained by diagonalization. And they're called normal modes. You can rewrite this process in new coordinates. The symmetric matrix basically defines some kind of ellipsoid, which has major and minor and semi-minor axis, because it's symmetric as orthogonal axis. And when you go to those axes, you just get a sum of harmonic oscillators. You know, each one of them has its velocity, and it has uh, its displacement, which is now what we have already derived before called an eigenvector. And the number in here can be interpreted as frequency. This is totally general for any classical Hamiltonian that's smooth around its bottom. It can be generalized to Hamiltonians which have critical points, uh, which are maybe top of the potential you can have solutions which are unstable in all directions, or settle point, something that has zero derivative, but in one direction you climb in potential liberation, you go down. 
in which case it's called hyperbolic mode. And instead of having sines and cosines describing time evolution, you'll have hyperbolic sines and cautious along the eigen directions of the system, totally general setting. Next, we'll work out a few examples. I'm yours. Um, I have a question. A beautiful, <laughs> beautiful, uh, go ahead, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, so we are describing basically um, the, the Hamiltonian ex exerted on one particle, meaning on uh, one particle from its surrounding. In that example. No, the you know the beautiful thing about this is that we have gone into very high dimensions immediately, and uh, the first application I will show next in the next video will be three particles or you know one heavy and two light particles basically three particles is the first time it starts to get interesting you know for two particles we have harmonic law which is you know in gravity that's called kepler law but it's basically same as one particle moving in infinite potential you can always write it that way and if you call it mechanics, it's Hooke's law and just single spring. So that's a boring thing, and that's the one that you know. Now, here we are going to any number of atoms in a molecule. Or, for example, we are going to the Jupiter-Saturn asteroid belt stability analysis, where you have Lagrange points and you have um, phase space in which each uh, celestial body has six, uh, three coordinates and three momenta, and uh, you multiply it by number of the bodies. So what's wonderful about this, and you know, we'll take it to infinity later in the course, so we'll look at uh, infinite spring matrices and infinite strings, that's called field theory. Uh, so. Uh, it's, it's really, really important that this matrix is much bigger than uh, one body coordinates. It always works when you're just distorting things from its their resting position. The resting position is called equilibrium. So this is like a mattress, you know, where the kids are away. The moment the kids jump on it, then, you know, I've given it impulse. And uh, if it's non-dissipative mattress, it'll ring forever. And the beauty of normal modes is that it'll be just sum of harmonic oscillators once you understand the coordinates and we have all the tools. Thank you. Sure. I'm just earning my living. And it's so, so much pleasure to see your face, actually. I can tell you. I've been cooped up in an apartment most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so now, you know, preparing videos for this is driving me insane. I could spend the rest of my life just doing these videos and doing nothing at all. Like I want, can't pay the bills. Or anything. So the quality is going to go down. You know, on Thursday I start just doing it as though this is a classroom. I'll write down things and we discuss it. But I still have a video. And this one, I was too lazy to split in many pieces. So it's longish. And uh, please stop me any place along it by speaking very loudly, waving or something, and I'll stop it and restart it. It has several pieces to it. You know, I'll, uh, I've told you what normal modes are. It's just a very general application of Hooke's law, any situation in which you push something and you get the response proportional, that's called linear response theory proportional to it, you use normal mode. Uh, but then there are tricks, uh, and you know, this projection opera, as I told you, actually very useful because the symmetries are very important. So the big idea in the next video is I'll sneak in the notion of symmetry, which I haven't talked about yet. And it's the most important notion in theoretical physics.
I will use a very simple system. Carbon dioxide, two oxygen molecules, a carbon molecule in the middle, aligned on a line, that's called collinear, and we'll only consider the classical version of that system in which these three bodies are connected by two springs, by two harmonic potentials. And we will find the vibrational eigenmodes of that system to illustrate the power of uh, thinking in terms of eigenvalues and eigenmodes and eigenfunction and eigenvectors, one. But number two, I will use this to sneak in a very important concept that uh, shapes almost all of modern theoretical physics, and that's the concept of symmetry. My message will be very simple, and it will be repeated 10 times this semester. If you have a symmetry, use it. Consider a situation in which our physical problem is defined by a Hamiltonian function. What is a Hamiltonian function? That's an operation that you apply on the state of the system and returns a number which is called energy of the system. So that's meaning of Hamiltonian function. It's an amazing thing because it takes many, many uh, dimensions, returns one number energy. But if you vary this function, you get equations or motions which are high dimensional set of things. And assume that there is another matrix, a very simple one. For example, you permute several directions in the space, which you used to call x, you call y, or you reverse the direction in which you move. So that's a simple matrix. The system has a symmetry. That means that the energy of the system measured once I've changed these coordinates around is still the same energy. That means that I can first measure the energy, then permute coordinates, or I can first permute the coordinates, measure the energies, and I get the same result. That's an example of a symmetry. During this course, I'll define it in two or three more ways, but that's one way to understand symmetry. If you have two operations of the system, the symmetry operation and the does that mean that energy is conserved or that it's invariant? In this very simple examples in this course, I'm always using conserved energy. But when I went through these, you know, examples called Trotter formulas, many, many steps of a changing evolution matrix. You know, we first define exponential as saying, uh, Matrix M can be written as E exponential of T times A. Now, in quantum mechanics, this is called T over I T over H bar times Hamiltonian function, but it doesn't matter. I mean, classical mechanics, there are no I's, but uh, it's the same mathematical structure. Uh, when you say that, you assume that the law of motion doesn't change in time. You know, Hamiltonian is always the same. Now, when you're computing a celestial mechanics problem of sending a, a rocket someplace or sending, a, you know, understanding how exoplanets move around, when you're living on an exoplanet, your environment is changing all the time because, you know, you're getting slower, faster. So if you are thinking of everybody else, uh, for example, the heavy planets are moving very slowly. So as far as you know, they are pretty much static. Uh, then you can replace your Hamiltonian by time-dependent Hamiltonian and along your orbit. And that's what these Trotter formulas were, time-ordered products. You know, I, I gave you this idea that at every step it changes. So in general, uh, we have always changing environment, but for purposes of today's lecture, we just assume nothing changes. It's Hamiltonian, it's time invariant, so the energy is always the same. You know, 
when I measure it. And it's okay. the eigen mode. Okay. So when you say changing the coordinates, is that like changing a frame of reference or is that like rotating the object? Or I guess it's the same. Yeah. So, you know, so that's kind of the deep thing about how you solve problems that we have several centuries of. <coughs> it's uh, the way we write laws of nature is that uh, we write them, you know, following Newton and Leibniz. So basically, what we do is we say, I have some symmetries which are in our uh, Newtonian world, three dimensional space, doesn't matter what's the X coordinate. There are rotations. If I rotate my system, that's a symmetry. And depending on the problem, there could be Galilean symmetry, meaning the things don't depend on moving frames, but they depend on accelerations. You know, that's essence of both Newtonian and special relativity. So that's the starting point. Then what uh, Newton, Leibniz, and, you know, lots of old physics tells us, what happens if you perturb it by a little amount? Well, we only allow to perturb it by little amounts which are consistent with the symmetries of the problem. And that's how we get to write Hamiltonians as polynomials, even polynomials in coordinates and stuff like that, because, you know, uh, the energy is not allowed to change in time. So that's how we write the law. We write it as a bunch of coefficients, and then experiments determine the coefficients. So, for example, electromagnetism is a linear law like this which has, you know, the things that are allowed by special relativity. And then we measure speed of light and we are done. You know, we have a coupling constant, which is one, <laughs> one over 137 fine structure constant. So that's how we always, we always use the symmetries to write differential laws uh, by saying, you know, we write all possible invariants consistent with our physical assumptions. And then uh, there are very few things that we have to uh, nail later and their coupling strength, maybe masses of particles, stuff like that. That's how we get to the Hamiltonians and Lagrangians, which uh, maybe I'll get back to. Okay. Is, is this answering anything or I've gone too far? You know, I want yeah. to apologize both for the last week and this week. I, I'm assuming lots of physics already and, you know, you do, but some of the things the way I say them uh, might not remind you of something that you know. So you have to hold me to account, hold me responsible. I've loaded lots of things. In one week, I've gone from a matrix to differential e equations. <laughs> so so uh, I will now continue. Let's see where I... I will use a very simple system, uh, thinking in terms of eigenvalues and eigenmodes and eigenfunction and eigenvectors, one. But number two, I will use this to sneak in a very important concept that uh, shapes almost all of modern theoretical physics, and that's a concept of symmetry. My message will be very simple, and it will be repeated ten times this semester. If you have a symmetry, use it. Consider a situation in which our physical problem is defined by a Hamiltonian function. What is a Hamiltonian function? It's an amazing thing because the system has a system energy, then permute coordinates, or I can first permute the coordinates, measure the energies, and I get the same result. That's an example of a symmetry. During this course, I'll define it in two or three more ways, but that's one way as a symmetry. Next, we use spectral decomposition. Anytime we have a matrix, it has its own Hamilton Cayley equation, which I can write in a form of. And the main thing about spectral decomposition is that we can use the projection operators to replace the 
evaluation of the matrix on a high dimensional space by the sum of ordinary scalar numbers or the eigenvalues. And if you take any matrix function, uh, we can evaluate it as a set of ordinary one-dimensional functions returning one-dimensional number, one per each subspace. And we can use that to decompose the Hamiltonian into sum of Hamiltonians acting on the subspaces uh, defined by these projection operators. And you can visualize this by saying the original Hamiltonian was a big matrix, this guy here. But now we write it as a sum of blocks where it's a small matrix in a first uh, block corresponding to the first eigenvalue of this other matrix M. Second block, the eigenvalues of the simple matrix, let's say symmetry matrix M, block diagonalize the big Thing. So instead of having calculations with d square elements, we have a smaller calculation in each block. Now, I said it in words, but let us define explicitly what is a collinear carbon dioxide molecule in the classical description. There is a carbon, this mass little m, there are two oxygens with masses, capital M. They're connected by harmonic or string potentials with stiffness K. At uh, first instant in time, one oxygen is at position X1, the other one is at position X2, the third one is at position X3. So this defines the energy of the system because it tells it what the masses are and how stretched the two springs are. And now Newton's second law says that acceleration of particle one, two, three is proportional to the force it experiences, which is the stiffness of the spring, the mass of this particle, and the you know, stretching of the spring uh, corresponding to particle two. The guy in the middle has its little mass k, and it interacts with the particle on the left by stretching, and the particle on the right by stretching, and the right particle interacts, oxygen interacts with carbon by stretching. So that's our system. We can write this in uh, matrix form because it's a linear equation on the forces. We will look at a very special set of solutions for which the time dependence uh, factors out. So let's look at solutions which are called normal modes of the system. We'll be looking for a frequency omega such that we can separate position x at time t into a variable x1, 2, 3, and the time dependence is in this oscillatory function. If we put this in acceleration, we will uh, have to take two derivatives bringing, you know, i t down twice. And we get an equation which is uh, just equation uh, for the axis, time independent equation in which the matrix of interactions, which are, you know, these stiffness uh, renormalized by the mass, so the natural frequencies, uh, if you wish, for harmonic oscillators. Uh, what's acting on the first guy, what's acting on the second guy, the carbon in the middle, what's acting on the third guy, that should be proportional to omega squared to itself. And the secular determinant of this equation, h minus omega squared, its zero will give me the eigenfrequencies of such a system.
Now, this is three by three equation. So when I copy this, this determinant, I will get a cubic equation. You could stick this into mathematics or some other algebraic program, but not in this course. Here, we have to think first before we compute. What I want you to do, not in the rest of this course, but in the rest of your life as a scientist, and I don't care whether you will be doing graphene or general relativity or neuroscience or big data, whenever you approach a problem, the first thing you always ask yourself, does this problem have a symmetry? Second, if it does, you must use it. If you're not using the symmetry, you're doing it wrong. In this particular problem, you know, an oxygen is here, an oxygen is there. They have the same mass and they have the same strength of coupling to the center. So I can decide that this one is called one or this one is called three. Or in this particular case, I can just flip the axis to minus x. So they are now relabeled. But obviously the energy of the system at any instant in time doesn't change because nothing depends on how I label it. So there is a symmetry, and I can write it as a permutation matrix or a three by three matrix, where I send one to three, I don't touch the center, so two is remaining, and I send three to be one. What happens to the energy when I flip it? Remember the original Hamiltonian? It had A minus A zero, uh, et cetera. After you flip it, a goes from here, nothing changes to the center, and the other A goes from there, and that's, you can do this calculation twice. First, by multiplying them in one order and the other one, and you find the result is the same. In other words, uh, Hamiltonian commutes, it's a symmetry, sigma is a symmetry of Hamiltonian. Observation number one. Observation number two, if I flip the axis and flip it again, I should be back. And indeed, if I square the sigma, I just get identity matrix. Now, sigma square minus one, I can write it as sigma minus one times sigma plus one equals zero. So I can just write out hamilton cayley equation for the system just by thinking. And I can read off the eigenvalues. One eigenvalue is plus one, the other one is minus one. Whenever I have eigenvalues, I'm supposed to com construct projection operators. Remember projection operators? Uh, if I have i eigenvalue, projection operator corresponding to it is a product of m minus other eigenvalues for all the rest, product goes over the remaining ones, and uh, divided by lambda i minus j, just so it's normalized correctly. We worked out one case where I only have two eigenvalues already. What happens is when you have two eigenvalues, product is very simple. There's only one term left, so there is no product. And there are two projection operators. So let's evaluate them. The first projection operator, which I'll call P plus, is you take the matrix. Matrix right now is the sigma right here. Difference of the two guys is two, so that's this one half. This is minus one, so it's plus, I'll stick it in here. And this is sigma, and that's the projection operator, which I'll call plus because there's a plus here. And there's the other one where I uh, evaluate for negative eigenvalue. Then this becomes minus two. This guy has plus one in it. So the minus is cancel, and this sigma picks up a minus. So there are two projection operators. If I square either one of them, I'll get it back. Simple calculation. If I take a product of the two, but that's Hamilton Cayley, that's zero. And if I add them up, sigmas cancel, and I get 
two one half identity, so I have a completeness. So I have two spaces, and we can compute their dimensions that the traces numbers of ones on the eigen on the diagonal of the projection operator. And uh, for this one, you know, uh, if I take a trace of identity, I get three. If I take a trace of sigma, I just pick up one. So this is four divided by two. So this space is two-dimensional. The other combination, this one cancels in the center. And I have three minus sigma, which is one. In other words, I get two divided by two. And I have dimensional space. And I have decomposed three-dimensional space into two dimensions plus one. So what? Well, anti-symmetric is one dimension, so the matrix H is one dimensional, so we should be able to do that. I'll take a trace of one dimensional matrix, just because it's easier for me to do it this way. Uh, so I'm only dealing with numbers, but trace of one dimensional matrix is the only entry in the matrix. I snuck an idea here. If you're comfortable with Algon, but suddenly I'm taking traces. Are, are you fine with this? Okay. Because, you know, next time I'll do this in two-dimensional space, and you might wonder why. I will use a very simple system. At the sigma, I just get identity matrix. Now, so of identity, I get three. If I take a trace of sigma, I'm just dealing with numbers, but trace of one dimensional matrix is the only entry in the matrix, so it's no big deal. So one eigenvalue is I take Hamiltonian, multiply it by the anti symmetrization operator, take a trace that gives me eigenvalue. I substitute this guy, it's one half identity minus the flip. What's a trace? of Hamiltonian operator, it's some of these elements. So that's one half, two capital A's plus two A. That's this term here. What's the trace of H times sigma? We had computed that one as well. The trace is just two A divided by two. So that gives us a second term. And we find out that the first eigenvalue simply depends on the oxygen mass. We know that that eigenvalue has to be interpreted as frequency square. So uh, frequency square of the first mode, it has this eigenvalue. What's the eigenvector? Well, it's just the projection operator. It's one minus sigma. This is identity, this is sigma. The difference is this matrix here eigenvector, which involves the oxygens, nothing to do with center of the mass. So this is an eigenmode of this physical system in which carbon in the middle doesn't move, and the two oxygens are moving in and out in harmony. So the system breathes like that, and that's uh, one eigenmode. What happens in a symmetric subspace? Remember, that's a two-dimensional system. And we know one thing about the system. Hamiltonian will be two by two matrix. And its diagonal will be the sum of its eigenvalues. One of them I'll call L plus for symmetric, and the other one I'll call L zero. And that's, again, easy calculation. It's a trace of matrix, which we already figured out. This is that, plus the trace of reflection times H, which is just the element H. So this one depends on masses of both particles. So that means it's an eigenmode in which carbon and oxygen will move. Now it's two by two matrix. I could actually just you know, solve quadratic equation. But remember, if you have a symmetry, Choose it, and there is one symmetry that's obvious that we didn't even think about it. 
What happens to this system is if I translate and put it someplace else, its energy doesn't change. It's Galilean invariance of the, this problem. So I have a continuous translation symmetry. Whenever you have continuous symmetries, it suffices to understand what happens for infinitesimal change. So if I just change all coordinates by a little amount, then I'll find out that H acting on all coordinates should be H acting on slightly shifted coordinates, because remember what the Hamiltonian is? It depended on the distances between the pairwise distances between particles. It didn't depend on if I change uh, them all by the same amount. Measured in any translated coordinate, these two parts are the same, H depend. Uh, and that means that the extra term satisfies the equation that uh, H acting on the extra term is zero. And you know, this is a matrix, so this is a matrix of zero, which I write as one times matrix. In other words, a zero mode in the lingua of the subject. And the general principle is whenever you have continuous symmetry, there should be zero eigenmodes. What is now the meaning of the other eigenmode? So now we know the eigenvalue is just a sum because this one is zero. So what's its meaning? Whenever you have a zero eigenmode, the other eigenvector is not obvious because you can add this eigenmode to it. We can compute delta x for the eigenmode, and it just kind of changes its orientation. But in this case, there is a natural orientation. We can go into the center of mass in which we make sure that the three momenta of these three particles add up to zero and remain added up to zero. And the physical meaning of this eigenmode is that the two oxygens are going in one direction, the carbon in the middle is going in the other direction in such a way that any instant in time, the center of mass is not moving. So now, Having used symmetry and totally solved this problem of a carbon dioxide, we now understand also the physics of its eigenmodes. The anti-symmetric solution is the one in which carbon just sits and the two oxygens go in and out in unison. The other mode is the continuous symmetry mode saying that I can keep the thing here or I can put it there, energy doesn't change. As long as distance is the same, the energy of system doesn't change. It just depends on internal distances. That's a zero mode, consequence of continuous symmetry of the problem. And the remainder is a non-trivial mode in which the carbon moves in these directions, the two oxygens move in the opposite direction in such a way that every instant in time the center of mass of the system hasn't moved. It was solved all by hand and using symmetry. When you have a real problem in chemistry or in celestial mechanics, you might have thousand dimensions in your calculation. You still might have a symmetry just under the flip of a coordinate, you often, very often do that block diagonalizes the thing in two pieces. Now that each piece is a matrix of some dimension d plus and d minus. And now usually you have to do real work. You have to compute in those blocks separately by diagonalizing your own computer. But the saving using the symmetry is enormous and totally essential and never do a calculation without first using all symmetries. Now, I keep saying this because my students and do fluid dynamics for some reason never want to use symmetry <laughs> because the pictures are pretty and they don't want to do calculation using this. If you're a chemist or condensed matter physicist, they teach you quantum mechanics in such a way that you don't know how to do any calculation without the symmetry. But this principle is true of all calculations in classical or quantum.
No, I'm I'm being tedious, but it's the bane of my life. 